humble mind. A whole generation of Naruto games are unavailable to play legitimately on modern consoles nowadays. There are a slew of Naruto games locked seemingly forever to systems like the Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS and 3DS, GameCube, Nintendo Wii, PlayStation Portable, and the PS2, but I'm only going to be focusing on some specific Naruto titles released on the Xbox 360 for the purposes of this video. Tracking these games down was the catalyst for this whole Naruto deep dive discussion I'm about to take you on, and these two games specifically are reason enough to be upset in my opinion. The two games I'm talking about are Naruto Rise of a Ninja and its sequel Naruto The Broken Bond. So I recently got the craving for some Xbox and Xbox 360 games. I found myself super nostalgic for the games my brother and I would play a whole bunch growing up, like Gears of War, Halo, and Time Splitters. And while I was going down some random YouTube rabbit holes watching footage of games for the 360, I stumbled across some footage of a Naruto game that I had never seen before. Now, I had played one of the Clash of Ninja games on the GameCube with some friends in the past, but this game looked very different. It looked like it was a semi-open world Naruto game, perhaps with some action-adventure RPG elements. After some more digging, I discovered this game was in fact Naruto Rise of a Ninja on the Xbox 360. Now, as I said earlier, my brother had a 360 growing up, and I played a fair bit of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Halo 3, and Gears of War 1 and 2 with him back in the day. But back then, when I was a kid, a Naruto game would have completely flown under my radar. I'll be honest, I didn't really watch Naruto much growing up. It came on from time to time on TV, but by the time I was able to watch the episodes after school, I'd find myself knee deep into the middle of the show's plot and I never really felt like I knew what was going on. I liked what I saw, don't get me wrong, but I had trouble following the story when I jumped onto this moving train halfway and being an impatient kid, I did admittedly get a little tired of the over explanation and analysis that the characters would constantly interrupt the action sequences with. Looking back, this constant exposition was probably better than characters just grunting back and forth at each other to be fair, but I still loved Dragon Ball Z, go figure. However, as I've gotten older, I've gotten really curious about the series, especially after I got pretty heavy into My Hero Academia, which draws many parallels to Naruto. For example, instead of a village of people training to become ninjas, we have a school where kids go to in order to train to become superheroes. And of course, the over explanation of fighting techniques and tactics is taken pretty much one to one from Naruto and injected straight into my hero's plot lines and dialogue. In 2024 though, another reason I found myself so drawn to this as soon as I saw the footage was because the gameplay structure at a glance looks so similar to Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise. This was a rock solid game on the PlayStation 4, which I had just played for the first time in 2023. It was easily one of my favorite games that I played that year. I wasn't remotely familiar with Fist of the North Star prior to playing the game. In fact, I actually knew more about Naruto than I did Fist of the North Star back then. However, after I came out of the other side of my experience with Lost Paradise, I really became a fan of the series and thanks to my partner, I even started getting some of the original manga. So now I'm sitting here seeing this Naruto game that's tickling similar parts of my brain and I'm just like, I've got to try this thing out. Maybe Rise of a Ninja will make me fall in love with the world of Naruto, like Lost Paradise did for me with Fist of the North Star. So as a recap, I saw this sick looking Naruto game. I was getting nostalgic for the Xbox and Xbox 360 games that my brother and I would play together. I've heard so much praise about the backwards compatibility that Xbox Ones and series consoles have. So I decided to go for an Xbox One that my coworker was getting rid of. I found a copy of Gears of War in a goodwill. I already had a copy of Halo 2, so I was doing pretty good. I couldn't wait for a physical, so I just downloaded and installed Time Splitters 2, and I ordered Rise of a Ninja off of eBay, so then all there was to do was patiently wait for that one to arrive in the mail, and we're good to go. And lo and behold, one fine afternoon I hear a little knock on my door and find a Naruto game is waiting for me on my doorstep. This was the game I was beyond hyped to play, just something about it spoke to me and I was so ready to run around in the leaf village and explore it like I never had before, literally. I cracked open the case and I saw that it had the manual and everything, I'm loving the artwork, oh man this is going to be so sick. I pop in the disc and... So... Naruto Rise of a Ninja is not available to play on the Xbox One, nor the Xbox series by extension. I guess what my buddies told me about these consoles being able to play everything wasn't really true. And in fact, the more I investigated, I learned just how untrue that really was. There are actually quite a large amount of games that are unavailable to play on these newer consoles. In general, a lot of the games based on licensed properties like those from Marvel or any of the James Bond games besides GoldenEye just simply aren't available. Many sports games that use licensed music aren't available anymore, and certain Sega titles like Afterburner Climax have been lost to time due to just being 
taken off the store inexplicably. In fact, in my search, I found a site with 17 pages worth of 360 games not compatible with the One or Series consoles. And in that list, I confirmed that Rise of a Ninja's sequel, Naruto The Broken Bond, which was also an Xbox 360 console exclusive by the way, is not available on these systems either. And wait, so, okay, so apparently none of the 360 era Naruto games are available to play on the newer Xboxes. Another reason that you may find certain games aren't backwards compatible on the Xbox One or series consoles is because the developers want you to pick up their modern repackagings of the games instead. So let's say you have a copy of Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm 2 for the 360 for example. You can't play that game on the Xbox One, but you can shell out $40 to get the Ultimate Ninja Storm Trilogy and thus spend even more money if you'd like even though you've got a perfectly good working copy of one of the games included in that collection already. This absolutely blew my mind. I mean, even as a self-admitted totally fine with it but not necessarily a fan of the series type of guy, it is insane to me that many of the classic games of one of the goats of shonen anime is not available to play on these modern systems that tout backwards compatibility as such a big part of their console's features set. Naruto is a series that stands alongside Dragon Ball and One Piece as some of the most influential anime in the world, helping bring Japanese animation into mainstream worldwide culture, yet there are so many games even outside of my specific platform that I'm using as an example that are no longer available to play in an easy, legitimate way. As I alluded to earlier with Marvel games and James Bond, Naruto isn't the only one here lost to time. Of the 998 games released on the original Xbox, only 63 of them are available to play on the Xbox One or series consoles, and 633 of the over 2,155 total Xbox 360 games are available. What's with the fascination of 63 here, by the way? When it comes to some franchises like Tomb Raider, for example, you can still play Tomb Raider Anniversary, Tomb Raider Legend, and Tomb Raider Underworld, which is great, but if you want to try the Tomb Raider 2013 reboot and only have an Xbox One or Xbox Series console, you're out of luck. Oh, unless you want to repurchase the game via the Xbox One Definitive Edition version. Now, I'm not saying that re-releases, remasters, remakes, and repackagings are bad things necessarily. I mean, I just talked about that in one of my lounge videos, but all of this to me is just an example of how companies totally could allow you to have both. I mean, you can choose to play the original 360 Gears of War or the Gears of War Definitive Edition Remaster on an Xbox One, but you don't get the same treatment with Tomb Raider or Naruto Ninja Storm for some reason. And considering that the Xbox 360 Marketplace is going to actually shut down on July 29th, 2024, this means that some games will literally no longer be available unless you can track down the original disc for the game you want and a working Xbox 360 that has no hard drive or red ring of death issues. Only that lucky 6% of original Xbox games and 29% of Xbox 360 games that I mentioned earlier will continue to be available on newer Xbox consoles. For many who are fans of these classic games that I've mentioned, or if you're someone who has owned a newer Xbox for a while and have already done some digging into what's available and what's not available, this might be old news to you, but as I'm chronicling my own gaming journey here on this channel, there's new stuff I'm learning every day and this was news to me. I will go ahead and say that I did manage to get some playtime in with Naruto Rise of a Ninja, thank but it wasn't the easiest thing to do, and this whole experience really got me thinking about video game preservation and how games can become lost to time, greed, licensing, and paperwork. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with the game thus far, spoiler free outside of some of the abilities you get, and then I'll get into how I managed to even play the game in the first place since it's not available on the Xbox One. And finally, I'll wrap it all up circling back to that video game preservation topic that I've been talking about. First, let's start with why this game is worth hunting down and playing today. Right off the bat in Rise of a Ninja, you'll see that you're pretty much reliving the very beginning of the anime. Naruto is not very well liked by the aspiring Hokage, and he's learning about his origins, who he is, and his place in this world. He's got this drive and determination to become the very best, and that powerful spirit and enthusiasm that he's known for is there from the beginning, but that spirit gets deflated pretty quickly as the other kids and even some of the adults are quite rude to him from the offset. I'll become the best ninja in the village! Everyone will respect me then! My dad said not to talk to you. In the game, you have a reputation to build and uphold which you can increase by doing tasks for people of the village. This is also how you level up and get stronger. 
What I didn't expect playing this game for the first time was that while the structure of this semi-open world and the side quests you do feel somewhat similar to Fist of the North Star, which was what I was expecting slash hoping for, traversal around the village and how you build wealth is actually very different. The game actually borrows pretty heavily from collect-a-thon 3D platformers, which I did not expect at all. And at first I was thinking this would be kind of corny, but it was pretty sweet to be honest, and this kind of gameplay fits the show well since Naruto is such an agile character with lots of movement abilities. You're running around trying to collect ancient coins which you can use to win over a favor from villagers, help them out with their small businesses, buy weapons and items, and so on. You can also find gold coins in more rare, often hidden or harder to reach areas, which are used to upgrade your weapons and learn new skills. When I first got into the game and got through the opening sequences and was left to my own devices, I collected what felt like a hundred coins before I even really progressed the story. I got a little lost in the fun of that, being a bit of a platformer lover myself, and I did all of this before I even got the double jump ability. Speaking of that, there's so much verticality to the village's design. Once you get the double jump, it opens up even more as you can now reach areas that were just out of your grasp. and as as you walk around, you're bound to realize there's a possibility for even more vertical traversal as there are these various walls littered around the game sporting some chalk outlines of footprints Banjo-Kazooie style, signifying that there are spots for wall runs. Naruto jumps around in a way that reminds me of like Crash Bandicoot before getting that double jump, and I have to say that this little ninja gives a bit of a Sonic feeling too. He's a little too fast for his own good as he sometimes whips around corners too quickly for the camera to catch up, and this is even before you unlock abilities that make you run faster thanks to the infamous Naruto run ability. But Overall, the exploration is really rewarding and snappy once you get used to it, and using the jutsus you learn to unlock new areas is really cool. But I'll touch back on those jutsus here in a second. One of my favorite smaller features in Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise was that Kinshiro could run straight through people like a linebacker. I was hoping the game would keep a secret counter of this and maybe I'd get an achievement for being some kind of bully. That never happened, but it was still enjoyable mischievous fun regardless. While he's probably less than half of Kinshiro's size, Naruto can run into NPCs too, and thankfully it doesn't seem to affect your reputation meter. I love silly little things like that. They totally didn't have to implement this into the game, but they did, and it certainly injects some fun into your general traversal. Using the kunai as a pointer to guide you to the next landmark when you ask for directions was also a pretty genius little inclusion too, and something that we usually only see in vehicle-based games like Crazy Taxi or Simpsons Hit and Run. The music is pretty funky and lighthearted, so when you combine that with some of these old-school gameplay design choices and its reliance on platforming, this gives Rise of a Ninja this really fun flavor that's more reminiscent of something that you would see on the PlayStation 2 than what you would expect in an Xbox 360 game. It was super unexpected, but I dug it. Now, exploration is all well and good, but you can't have a Naruto game without fighting, obviously. There definitely are fights in this game, and again, much to my surprise, the fighting takes place on a 2D plane. Since I was running around in a 3D space, I sort of expected the fighting to be somewhat like Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi, or maybe an arena fighter like One Piece Grand Battle if you remember that game, but this is actually more akin to something like Street Fighter than it is Power Storm. A lot of the early fights can be conquered through button mashing, but there is a somewhat robust combo system, and it's worth learning those combos properly as soon as you can, because the fights can get pretty difficult at times. Another thing you can do on the battlefield are of course those various ninjutsu hand signals that the series is famous for, and this game gets a lot of praise even to this day for how it implemented this into the gameplay. In order to pull off those famous hand signals, you've got to hold down the left trigger and then push the joysticks in various directions to mimic those hand movements. Once you've done the correct sequence, you build up energy and finally let go once the aura touches the bar. It's difficult to do this in battle, to be honest. I failed at it pretty consistently and it took a while to get the hang of it. Most of the time, you can't even pull these off unless you knock someone down, and even then the pressure might get to you. But I think the beauty of this comes from the realistic nature of it. In the show, they were doing hand movements so fast it was like watching a rap battle or something because the characters in the show know that they're vulnerable when they're doing them. That's got to be a lot of pressure when you're going up against other fighters who can be so deadly. I think the developers really translated that well into the gameplay and I'm glad that they did it this way, even though there is admittedly quite a learning curve to pulling these off. I will also say that the fighting portions of this game can get difficult. You can counter someone else's counter who can then counter you, and there aren't any difficulty options so you just kind of have to get good and work on your reflexes. The QTEs for your special attacks also go by really quickly, and trying to defend yourself from the enemy ninjutsu attacks when you only have a split second to press the correct button can be really difficult, especially when you consider that the button you need to press as as well as the attack animations and QTE times change from time to time. I'm embarrassed to admit how many times I tried fighting Sakura before eventually just giving up and moving on, saving it for another day when I'm hopefully stronger. Here's a little compilation of all of those moments though. <laughs> The 
And while I was capturing some additional footage, I did actually manage to defeat Sakura. It wasn't the cleanest victory of all time, but we take those. So there is a little bit of whiplash here and there between the different modes of play. Exploration is really chill, intuitive, and it feels more like Tide the Tasmanian Tiger or Spyro the Dragon than anything else, but then the battles are a different animal entirely. All in all though, I've had so much fun in my playthrough thus far. Watching the cutscene straight from the anime, seeing all the different types of challenges the game has to throw at you, and the exploration especially is something that'll never get old to me. I could boot the game up right now and still get lost collecting ancient coins. It's also a really funny game, which is something that I evidently missed when I was watching bits and pieces of the show back then when I was a kid. Naruto makes so many different faces and his reactions are so over the top, and I found out that I'm just one of the thousands of kids who is roped into the age-old tradition of falling victim to Haku's beauty. We'll meet again sometime. She's kind of hot, honestly. Oh, by the way, I'm a boy. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of beauty, you may notice that this game just looks absolutely gorgeous. We all know cell shaded games hold up pretty well, but it just looks sharp too, right? Almost too good to be an Xbox 360 game. Well, that's because, shame on me, I didn't go pick up an original Xbox 360 just to play Rise of a Ninja on it. I did decide to keep my copy of this game because now it feels like I'm legitimately preserving another casualty of society, preserving lost media that is. With that said, I'm going to segue into how I ended up being able to play this game because trust me, it wasn't very easy. To be honest with you, I have a lot of experience with emulation, soft modding consoles, installing patches and mods, and messing with config files. I love trying new things and getting the most out of any given console. Breaking free from whatever confines these big video game mega corporations are trying to hold me to is a great feeling and I especially don't feel bad once the console and its games go out of production. I think the first console I ever modded was a Nintendo Wii back in the day, but I essentially have zero experience emulating anything past like PlayStation 1 levels of power. In fact, I've never emulated Xbox 360 or PS3 stuff before. Naruto Rise of a Ninja was in fact the first game of this caliber, so to speak, that I've ever tried to run on a PC. I started researching 360 emulation and quickly found out about this program called Xenia. I heard from friends that emulation of the consoles from this generation is still progressing and not perfect, so naturally I looked up the compatibility that Xenia has with Rise of a Ninja, which led me to Xenia Canary, a version of Xenia that seems to run this game better. Rise of a Ninja is kind of a unique game in that it runs at 30 frames per second in the open world free roam portion of the game, but it runs at 60 frames per second during the fight scenes. So that means that if your emulator is set to run everything at a smooth 60, which for most games is generally preferable and this is often the default value, when you play in the open world segments of the game, everything runs at double the speed, which is hilarious. Another issue I ran into playing the game was screen tearing. Now it was most notable for me when I was looking at certain buildings and structures. As you can see here, if I move the camera to the left or the right really quickly, the building walls just kind of jitter and split here and there, that's screen tearing. It didn't bother me enough to not enjoy the game, but if there was a way I could fix it, I wanted to find it, especially if I wanted to capture footage of this thing, which I did, because this game is so pretty running at higher resolutions on the PC. I'll save you the details, but there's a lot of outdated information online about what works and doesn't work in regards to running this game properly, and there's a lot of information that didn't necessarily apply to me since everyone's setup is a little different, so I had to basically trial and error a lot of PC settings and settings within Xenia's configuration files to make it work. And though so far, I've I've only had minor issues, there is also this constant worry in the back of my mind that the game will crash. From a homebrewing and hacking perspective, the original Xbox was cracked wide open, so even to this day at the time of this video's release in the year 2024, the only way to mod an Xbox 360 is to do some actual hardware adjustments to the console. As you can imagine, Microsoft put a ton of security measures in place to ensure that their games could not be hacked or emulated as well as it was on the original consoles that they released. One of the security measures that Microsoft implemented is that the games on the 360 are programmed to run a check every now and then to ensure that it's actually being played on real hardware. And apparently many people have run into this check when playing Rise of a Ninja. Once the game realizes that it's being emulated, it will just crash out immediately. Again, fingers crossed this hasn't happened to me yet, but it's a constant worry. So I saved this game more than the most experienced JRPG enthusiasts do. 
After this headache, getting an actual Xbox 360 is definitely still a real possibility for me if I want to try any of these other games not backwards compatible with the newer systems, but keep in mind these consoles aren't known to be the most stable and long lasting ones. I mean, when we're talking about the Xbox 360, even to this day the Red Ring of Death is still one of the first things that people think of, and I've heard from a lot of friends that they've had hard drive failures on their systems. By the way, these were the settings I changed in my config file in order to get this game running properly for me to get it looking sharp at a proper frame rate without screen tearing. Again though, do your own research and understand that my system is likely different from yours. Despite the headache here, don't take this as any slight towards the Xenia team. This program is absolutely fantastic and if I were in charge of developing it, I probably wouldn't have been able to get a Commodore 64 game running, let alone Rise of a Ninja, so definitely check it out if you want to play your legally purchased backups of games. For educational purposes, of course. I did run into one glitch so far where the screen would black out when I activated rage mode, and that did often result in me losing a battle here and there, but again, fingers crossed, I haven't had any other issues yet, and to be fair, maybe this was an issue in the original game too, I'm not really sure. Though I have really enjoyed the game thus far, and it's gradually making me become more and more of a Naruto fan, there was a tinge of sadness and frustration holding on to those triumphant feelings that the game was giving me because I know there's a solid chance that a lot of people will never be able to play this game. I was able to get Rise of a Ninja going on my system after a day or two of troubleshooting off and on, so relatively quick despite some of those initial issues, but I know a lot of people might not have a system strong enough to run it, the technical know-how to set it up, or simply the patience to deal with the initial hurdles that running this game properly presents, plus ethical concerns, of course. Even if you're the biggest Naruto fan in the world, getting an Xbox 360, a controller, the game, and so on, that's kind of a big ask, especially since 360s aren't the most reliable console, and there are other Naruto games you can obtain easier. Naruto Rise of a Ninja and its sequel The Broken Bond are 360 exclusives made by Ubisoft, and since Bandai Namco now owns the rights to Naruto entirely as far as I understand, these Ubisoft games are unlikely to ever see the light of day again. On the Xbox 360, there were 6 Naruto games available in total. Ninja Storm 2, 3, Generations, and Revolution were all made by Bandai Namco and were also available on the PS3, but these two Ubisoft Naruto games are locked to the 360. Ninja Storm 1, 2, and 3 were remastered into a trilogy collection in 2017 as I said earlier, but Generations and Revolution and of course Rise of a Ninja and The Broken Bond are all trapped on their original consoles. Generations and Revolution are seen as incremental titles in the Ninja Storm series, but I think their inclusion in the trilogy collection would have still been nice to have for fans, especially considering that the games had some gameplay and story elements that were unique to them. And though the first Ultimate Ninja Storm does provide a hub world to run around in, and the Uzumaki Chronicles series on the PlayStation 2 offers some exploration, the general flow and world building in Rise of a Ninja is much better in my opinion. And I've heard that the Broken Bond is even better, so it's just a shame that Ubisoft and Bandai Namco can't come to some sort of agreement and get these games back out there again. I think that with the tools available in game development today, a proper sequel to the Broken Bond could easily be the best Naruto game we've ever seen, and who wouldn't love a remastered collection of the two original games? Additionally, and first off I have to commend them for keeping it running this long to be honest, Microsoft did unfortunately confirm that on July 29th, 2024, the 360 storefront will shut down as I mentioned earlier. This means that these games will either need to be purchased digitally before that date or you'll have to find a physical copy if you want to play them legitimately. It's just unfortunate that it looks like we're in a situation where these games won't see the light of day again since they were made by a different company and were overshadowed by the Ninja Storm series. While all of the Naruto games have a lot of similarities in one way or another, Rise of a Ninja and the Broken and Bond are arguably the most unique titles out there, and I'm so glad I'm getting to play at least one of them now. Through whatever means you have available, hopefully you can try it too. It's looking like Rise of a Ninja and the Broken Bond are lost media, abandonware that will one day be all but forgotten, unless Ubisoft and Bandai Namco can reach some kind of agreement one day. It's in these games that I've found two more big reasons why I think emulation is important and necessary for the preservation of video games. The industry is no stranger to anti-consumer practices, and the modding communities seem to be the ones who pour the most love, effort, and ingenuity into these old games that would otherwise be lost to time. But that's a topic for another day. Just look out for yourself, and if you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, Stay humble.